Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Dr. Christine Nickel. I'll be the moderator for this Adil conference session. Before we be begin, on behalf of Adil, we'd like to thank our generous sponsor, Noodle, and our host, Old Dominion University. We're thankful for their contributions in making this event possible. Thank you for joining us for The Bicycle of Your Mind, How AI Accessibility Technology is Enhancing Learning for All Students. And please welcome Dr. Simon Mahayevsky. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session. Um, my name is uh, Simon Mahayevsky, and I'm uh, an Associate Director of uh, Academic Technology at University of uh, Illinois, Chicago. I've uh, been teaching computer science for the last uh, 20 years or so. And uh, my passion is in accessibility. Uh, our, our department takes care of uh, accessibility for the academic technology uh, that ranges from LMSs, uh, video systems, and, and others. And uh, we're just really excited about uh, this new wave of innovation that's coming, where we have the time to consider accessibility uh, more or less from the beginning, unlike when it's kind of an add-on um, afterwards. So in this session, I want to open up with uh, uh, research that was done and published uh, some years ago uh, in the 70s in the uh, Scientific American, where uh, there was a, a quick uh, kind of overview of the locomotion uh, capacity of various animals. And uh, uh, also um, we added some machines to that. So what this uh, research was about is to see uh, what creature or machine could be the most efficient at moving? And so you really wanna be in the uh, lower right side of this graph, meaning that with very little energy, you can move very, very large objects. Now, human on foot kind of is in the middle of the pack where we have some animals that are much better at carrying uh, weight such as horses and others. And then we build machines to carry even uh, larger weights. But it was interesting to find that a cyclist, so a human being on a bicycle, was actually in this kind of a magical spot where, where at a very little energy, we were able to carry quite a large load. So the efficiency of that combination of a bicycle and a human being was really a sweet spot for efficiency. Now, this research has been used uh, multiple times to talk about this concept that we are tool makers. Human beings are tool makers. And this is how we beat or we overcome natural differences. Because once you are on the bicycle, you might have otherwise a uh, uh, very athletic body. You might have uh, perhaps just a standardized body. And yet you are able to go far and you are able to do it very efficiently. So I want to start by introducing humankind as tool makers, which is why this adoption of this new tool, which is AI, is hugely important. And it's so important to remember that when we build tools, not only do we overcome difficulties and create new opportunities, but by creating tools, we also create transformations in our society. Now, today, you, of course, can see how maybe the modern camera on the phone uh, changed the way a police uh, does their business, changed the way we report on wars, changed the way uh, we look at uh, evidence. Well, bicycles back in that day, so it was end of 19th century, uh, were a symbol of women's emancipation. In fact, the women's uh, movement for voting uh, its symbol was the bicycle. And, and I encourage you to, to, to do a little research in that direction, but bicycle really changed the fact that women were able to get places in pairs or on their own and do that safely and quickly. So technology can transform our society and it can make tremendous difference in various things that we tried to do before. So we are tool makers. Now, going back to uh, accessibility, I want to take as an example, audiobooks. Now, I love audiobooks. Um, I, I, um, they help me to uh, use my time well, especially when traveling, and so they kind of speak right into to my heart. But uh, audiobooks have various benefits. 
I just jotted a few of them down, uh, such as they help to reduce negative thinking. Now, some of these benefits overlap with reading uh, books, uh, but it's more like a Venn diagram probably where uh, textbooks will have uh, some benefits uh, and, and then audiobooks some others. However, in this list of benefits, notice that uh, uh, some people actually believe that audiobooks have the same benefits as reading. Uh, that, uh, of course, here with all audiobooks specifically, they help to relax our eyes, they impact our sleep, but the audiobooks help to build literacy skills. Now, maybe some uh, educators kind of react to this, oh, no, no, reading is just so much better. And, and there, there, there are plenty of people that uh, are so affected by reading where they will remember where they were when they read that book or where they were when they read that passage. And it, it, it is embedded into the way they think, but not, not others. Some people, such as people with this like semi, struggle to identify it so well with reading as, as the intake process. So that leads me to the fact that when audiobooks were introduced, of course, audiobooks came from um, uh, recording on tapes. It came from helping blind people to uh, step into the world uh, of books by, by a kind of personal transmission where they could change the books anytime they wanted. And yet academics responded in a very familiar uh, way. Audiobooks, right, might be cheating. Maybe they're not because we culturally were so embedded into thinking that a good student had to read what they were assigned and then writing was how we assess them. So this um, example of audiobooks helps us to see that we are tool makers. We in the past have already built beautiful tools for students with disabilities, but really for everyone. Because audiobooks help people who are uh, who do not have disabilities, who uh, have uh, who who perhaps are in transit uh, or, or people uh, uh, where where there is a second language involved. So I think audiobooks are a great example of their history and also their impact today on how technology can help, just like the bicycle, the tool uh, making bicycle. Now, before we get into more detail on how AI and accessibility work together, I wanna address another uh, issue here. And this issue uh, was uh, well described in this uh, paper about entangled pedagogy. Now, what, what, what do we mean? Well, faculty have struggled with innovation in uh, technology for years. Take the calculator, take even online learning, or as we saw, audiobooks, uh, you know, some people felt it, it was cheating to listen to an audiobook versus to, to read it. So sometimes we might feel like there is a, a technology cart and a pedagogical horse. And we sometimes end up putting that uh, technology cart uh, in front of uh, the pedagogy horse. And that certainly it feels like that sometimes with online learning. How are you going to use all these tools in your teaching versus here is my pedagogy, how will these tools uh, help me uh, with that? So this quote here that entangled pedagogy encourages teachers, students, and others to collaborate was embracing uncertainty, imperfection, openness, and honesty, and develop pedagogical knowledge that's collective, responsive, and ethical. So what we mean here is that sometimes it's okay for a faculty member to say, I don't know, and show vulnerability and say, well, you know, this chat GPT or, or these other generative AI systems, at this point, I don't know. But I will invite students to collaborate with me and entangle this way, we are going to um, uh, carry out new knowledge. We're going to work on this together. So this uh, paper was primarily addressed uh, uh, for online learning and, and how technology there is often has a bigger focus than pedagogy but we can add AI to it as well and all the new waves that will come afterwards that uh, faculty, when say, when we are asked by a student with uh, disabilities about some accommodation, it, it, it might be the way to handle this, I don't know, but I'll check on that. We're going to learn together. We're going to work through that together. So the next uh, piece I want to share is kind of where uh, AI uh, is and and um, some of the tools that I'm going to show you uh, how they rank in this kind of onion shape of AI. So artificial intelligence in general is quite broad. 
uh, it uh, includes uh, using computing in a different way, in a way where the machine perhaps is learning on its own or it's processing uh, camera input and it's recognizing, it's very able to match pictures to, to things. So the layer of machine learning, it's quite commonly used for the last probably 15 years or so. That's the ability of computers to learn from experience on data without human programming. This was quite a breakthrough when this technology was developed. Prior to that, you had to write a program, tell it everything you wanted it to do, and you couldn't expect uh, something else. Uh, it would have been an error or a bug if, if it did something else. So machine learning is used with accessibility quite extensively uh, uh, for, for, for a decade or so. Then we have deep learning, which mimics the human brain using artificial neural networks, such as transformers to allow computers to perform complex tasks. And part of the word chat GPT or the GPT is, is transformer. So this is where we came up with a new tool to take the automated learning that's happening in the machine and then make allow it to make connections that we did not plan for before. And, and, and that's deep learning. And then what we've uh, kind of discovered in November of 22, uh, with, uh, or, uh, which by the way, um, uh, my uh, my team was involved in a in a hackathon about five years ago, where we connected AWS AI called Comprehend to discussion forums, and we would measure the emotional stress of students in the post that they were making, and then alert uh, an instructor if there was uh, some crisis going on, or we would graph out how happy students were in the course. So that was about five years ago. But uh, generative AI made the news recently. And this is where, after the deep learning happens, uh, the system generates new text, audio images, uh, video, or code based on content it has uh, been pre-trained -pre on. So this is where we have kind of bubbled up to. And ChatGPT, of course, is the chat interface for the deep learning, for the machine learning, for the AI. So in addition to, to chat text-based input, there are other ways to get there. Now, a quick uh, uh, thought about um, policies, because the moment we talk uh, AI, some in the university will respond, well, do you have a policy for that? Do you put a policy in your syllabi? So I would encourage you to look at what's happening in the UE, uh, in the uh, EU uh, for um, uh, European uh, uh, Union. Um, and so the idea there is that they were able to prioritize the use of AI and then how uh, to manage the risk. And so uh, if you look at uh, uh, the high risk area to access employment, education and public services, safety components and vehicles, law enforcement, et cetera, they view that as high risk. And this is where our educational content likely is going to lie as well. Um, and then social scoring, mass surveillance, manipulation of behavior causing harm, they looked at it as an unacceptable. So we have to be careful when we, when we adopt AI and we wanna make sure that students have access to it, not just uh, from the view of disabilities, but when we pay for certain versions of ChatGPT and we have already learned that the output of the paid version is actually different in quality than from the free version, this also, um, uh, kind of provides uh, uh, considerations for access. Okay, so we are right now uh, in the path of development of AI in version one, where the command line or the chat interface exists. There are some innovations, which I'm going to show you in version two. This is where the graphical user interface is happening. So instead of having to provide a prompt, just like maybe in the DOS or, or a Linux system, we had all these prompts we were doing. Uh, now we're going to use buttons, sliders, in order to produce output from AI. And I'll demonstrate uh, to you how, how that will happen. Afterwards, and we know this will happen because this has happened with other computing uh, systems, we're going to reach the universal user interface, such as uh, natural language processing and video processing, where we might be just talking to uh, Alexa skills or other systems, and it will uh, uh, it will allow us 
kind of a universal approach. So think about how we communicate today. You can make a phone call, right? You can email, you can text, and text was this kind of a synchronous uh, interface. Uh, a lot of people are still doing text. And then you could do FaceTime. And so FaceTime is when you see the person and, and you're talking to them. So the, this is the growth of interfaces that we uh, are likely to see. But we won't be talking about AI for much longer because AI is going to become ubiquitous just like the internet is and databases, right? So we're not saying, hey, in my learning management system, the database is so great. This is so invisible, it's under the covers that no one is even talking about it. So just like uh, the idea, hey, we used to say that a lot, it's on the internet or you know, put it on the web. We no longer talk about it. It's basically how we do business. So we look forward to switching from this kind of a preview of the technology with chat GPT is, which is why it's free, into its uh, more mature form at an enterprise level. So now I'd like to show you uh, one of the innovations that's, that's taking place at the graphical user interface level. So a company called uh, Anthology is um, produced this uh, system called uh, AI Assistant uh, for instructors to build their courses. Now, the AI Assistant does not use a command line. In fact, it's using uh, a slider here for complexity. So if you want to have your output to be at a K-12 level versus university level, you just use the slider. If you were using ChatGPT, you would have had to specify that on the prompt. Uh, and then how many elements you want to produce. This particular functionality produces uh, learning modules inside of the course. And so it is going to use the name of the course uh, as kind of the idea of what the learning modules need to be. But then you can also enhance it by providing description. In this example, I called my course Square and without any added information, setting the uh, complexity to low for elementary uh, school, my descriptions for a class about squares is quite uh, on point. Introduction to squares, uh, identifying squares and so forth. Now, this is a great power in accessibility that AI has, and that, it, that is setting the level of output. So when you say, explain it to me like I'm five years old, now, we might not kind of appreciate it as, as faculty, what that does, but if you take a paragraph from a textbook, you put it even in, in the existing chat experiences, and then you say, explain that to me, give more examples, or even more summarize in simple terms. This pro makes content more accessible. This helps us to, to produce, without having to rework it ourselves, to produce accessible uh, 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 content for students. And I use the word accessibility here in a broader context, not just students with accessibility, but students who perhaps um, want to understand it, uh, it and, 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 and not just read it and pass the test. They can have a conversation about it. So here's the, uh, another link where uh, more, more examples are available. Now this particular AI design assistant also creates rubrics it also will create automatically questions for a document. So let's say you're uploading um, uh, or you created a document in your LMS. You can say, create this many multiple choice questions for me. Um, in this instance, it creates a rubric that can be simply adopted uh, in the course. So you probably know well that in ChatGPT at the text level, you can go ahead and put in description in, in, the, in uh, the prompt and it will produce a rubric, but here we have simply uh, graphical user interfaces. Now for accessibility, of course, um, text uh, level, so chat style systems are a little bit easier to provide accessibility for. So for screen readers to work with them or to allow resizing or contrast, web accessibility steps into this really well. And so when this particular product was deployed inside of uh, the learning management system, the regulations and the requirements that the vendor had for the rest of the learning management system also apply to this graphical user interface. Now, of course, as uh, AI uh, systems are deployed in the wild, su such as in a commercial system, their relationship to web accessibility might be different. So we're really happy to see 
uh, these uh, vendors stepping into this very important space. Now, there is uh, even deeper adoption of AI for accessibility inside of um, LMS systems. And uh, if you teach for a school that uh, is using this particular product and you could be uh, in, in just about any LMS to do that, you have been using machine learning. So LI happens to be a product that will take uh, a course document and then it'll automatically produce alternative formats for students. Well, how does it do that? It do does that through machine learning. So it will kind of sink its teeth into a document, whether it's Word document, PDF, or another document, and it is going to learn about it so that it can present it as HTML, which is often uh, very easy to consume for a screen reader, uh, EPUB, which works well on the mobile device, electronic braille, which of course has a very uh, specific application, uh, or uh, it'll produce an audio system. Now we just talked about audiobooks a little bit, but this allows us uh, to, um, uh, to to connect it uh, to your content. Uh, I'm looking briefly at the chat. Uh, is Li available for Canvas? Yes, it is. So uh, many Canvas schools are using it. And uh, the um, uh, design assistant right now is uh, deployed uh, only in the uh, Blackboard LMS. But as you know, these vendors kind of work together and if we can support and, and kind of uh, um, um, talk about what works, they tend to uh, kind of borrow from each other. So then we have the Beeline, lead, uh, Beeline Reader. Now, I don't know if you ever looked at the Beeline Reader, but I encourage you to uh, take a quick look because it's an excellent tool for changing the way people read. And uh, I'm really happy that this is one of the, uh, the options that's produced for students because once you kind of uh, realize that, you know, reading is of course a skill, but some mindsets and some eyes and, and some, uh, you know, circumstances kind of make reading uh, easier. So the Beeline Reader really helps to go through content and to really be on that bicycle uh, for reading. And then the immersive uh, reader that's available from, uh, from Microsoft. Now I will talk about Microsoft in just a little bit more, but uh, this particular tool uh, is just uh, awesome when it comes to uh, the options it provides, the, uh, uh, the readability, and um, how your document is then uh, shown. And then uh, this particular uh, machine learning system also is able to translate into multiple languages. And so translation was one of the features of AI systems uh, for a long time. It just, again, we never called that AI, right? We just kind of assume that, hey, uh, these are automatically translated, uh, it's just what computers do. But all of that is part of that uh, AI um, uh, technology. In the background here, in the middle of the slide, you can see a document that's presented to an instructor. So this is content produced by the instructor or maybe borrowed from a textbook. And then the machine learning system processes and finds an image, and then the image does not have a, a description. So the system is going to take the instructor through a tutorial of how to improve accessibility of this document. Now, the alternative formats are automatically created, but the system then provides feedback to the instructor. Well, you have 27% um, uh, kind of a score, accessibility score here to take it to maybe 70% add description to this to this image. And then after that, it'll it'll ask to, to do something else. So here's where we raise awareness with instructors, but most of all, we're able to quantify, right? We're able to quantify uh, the accessibility of documents. And that's very important because uh, you are able to then um, uh, process all, all your documents and see your uh, progress. So switching to uh, kind of an overall view of how AI uh, works in accessibility, one of the uh, uh, strongest features of AI is the text-to-speech. So this is where machine learning models can generate uh, a, a natural sounding speech from text, converting digital books 
or documents to audio formats for students with visual impairments. Now we've been familiar with this, of course, for, for some time, but that is one of the winning features of, of uh, AI. Image and diagram description. So computer vision, machine learning systems can analyze images and diagrams and output text descriptions for blind students. Automated captioning. Machine learning can automate captions for videos and audio content for deaf and hard of hearing students. Now, notice please that just like any technology, and you can go back to a bicycle, we can say, well, you know, walking is so much better because uh, you can fall down the bicycle and you can get all the places with a bicycle. We all agree that automated captioning is not perfect, right? And it does not even uh, meet the standards for um, uh, compliance, but, it is a step forward and it is at least a kind of a helpful to instructor who can then go back and at least modify the words and bring that compliance to, to expected levels. And of course, AI is getting uh, better and better. Therefore, uh, the automatic captioning is also going to, um, uh, to grow. Uh, translation is a great example, again, of uh, how AI helps uh, text simplification. So algorithms can simplify complex text to improve readability and comprehension, comprehension for students with learning disabilities. Now, this is where we really have a spectrum because everyone could use a little simplification in text. If you uh, remember the last scientific uh, article or, or journal article that you've read, uh, it's, it's hardly even English at some point. And so there's software that's going to take a, a, a journal article and then break it down for you and then answer your questions, right? So we're saying that uh, these features of AI can really broadly help everyone, but they can also very specifically help students with disabilities. So summarization, where machine learning can summarize um, techniques uh, to distill lectures, article books, into key points and highlight uh, for learning disabilities. Uh, adaptive content. So um, AI can uh, reinforce learning. Uh, systems can learn to adapt digital curriculum by altering presentation formats, complexity levels, and so on. And then the predictive recommendations. And this is where we probably recognize AI uh, you know, from shopping on Amazon, where uh, you looked at one product and then suddenly the product you were actually lo uh, looking for appears because AI was able to make a connection. So this also can happen right inside of a textbook or, or inside of a document. Some of these technologies have been developed now for, um, for journal publishing, for scientific publishing. There are some uh, excellent tools like Quiver and, and others that will do that where you upload multiple documents multiple journal articles in your subject matter, and then you can ask questions about uh, content and have a conversation with these documents. So this uh, really shows us uh, kind of the overview of what AI does in terms of uh, little things, and then how today the chats that we see used and, and, and uh, uh, we talk about so much are just one interface, but others, are coming. And so this takes us really to uh, the part where we need to talk about the enterprise level, right? How do you take it a step up from just kind of disconnected uh, tools and, and make it powerful? Well, and I'm happy to say that this is where Microsoft really stepped up to the plate. So uh, AI has an entire uh, kind of section uh, on their website that they call AI for accessibility. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, their, their motto here, we're investing in AI tools to ensure the accessibility of learning materials, language development, and assistive technology options. So they, uh, and, and I have just a few links here that uh, I'll, I'll share with you, but uh, they have some projects that they are featuring. Uh, they also have grants, which uh, you can apply for and, and work with Microsoft on. The actual um, uh, movement, really, the timing of it is tremendous because in the past, most of these efforts are an afterthought, whereas now uh, Microsoft is building things from, uh, from uh, the very beginning. So let's for just uh, uh, about one minute, I'm going to switch to 
a different screen and I want to share with you um, exactly what Microsoft is doing for accessibility. So let's go ahead and watch it for a minute. There are 1 billion people around the world that live with a disability. Equally, 1.3 billion people will need assistive technology by 2050. At Microsoft, we believe that individuals with disabilities have a fundamental right to access and utilize technology effectively. Building a future in which everyone can reap the benefits of technology is more crucial now than ever before. Rapid advancements in technology and the accelerated pace of digital transformation present new opportunities to empower people and organizations. However, without the appropriate technology, these changes risk excluding or leaving millions of individuals behind in an increasingly digital world. In 2018, we introduced Microsoft AI for Accessibility, a program dedicated to empowering those living with disabilities. We want to invest in ideas that are either developed by, or in collaboration with, individuals with disabilities. Our grant program supports projects that leverage technology to empower those living with disabilities. We are looking for individuals or teams who are not only passionate about making the world more inclusive, but also firmly rooted in the communities they intend to benefit. We look forward to continuing our journey in bridging the disability divide and making the world a more accessible place for all. For more information on our program, visit aka.ms forward slash accessibility innovation. All right, so this is a really interesting uh, approach of this uh, commercial company. Uh, but I just want to show you a few things about the player that they even are using. So under captions, uh, I'm going to turn off the, the voice and, and play the video. But in the captions, uh, you can uh, change the customized uh, already um, layout. Um, you can change the size, the opacity. So uh, really some nice uh, examples of uh, Microsoft taking accessibility seriously from the start. Uh, and uh, as, as we consider what uh, we need to do as, as instructors, it, or, or, or instructional designers or, or uh, in administrative assignments, it, it can be uh, difficult to um, do all of this at once and, and um, you know, just even keep up with uh, expectations. So just like Microsoft has made uh, many other products, including Microsoft Office, uh, kind of a great success. And even in, in the Word document, in the Word system, they are uh, they have a checker for accessibility. Uh, I think that this is kind of the right way to to take AI to the next level for accessibility. And what you saw earlier uh, through uh, Anthology's uh, LMS, uh, the AI design assistant, this actually is produced by Anthology, but the back end is Azure from Microsoft. So their innovation uh, uh, was also, used by, by Anthology to produce some of the features uh, that we saw. Now, as we think about accessibility, uh, you might ask yourself, you know, what, what can I do next? Because oftentimes uh, the rules for accessibility continue to change. And of course we are still in the hype mode for AI uh, and, and the, the opinions are so, so divided. Uh, it may be difficult to, to, to uh, figure out where to start. So when it comes to AI for accessibility, uh, my recommendation would match the uh, recommendation by Dale Lane, who has um, a really nice um, uh, TEDx talk on kind of the topic of where, um, where education needs to be in this, uh, with this new AI innovation. And the point that he's made in, in this TEDx talk is that if you consider example of typewriters, where you know initially in order to produce publications, you have to have someone type it out. School stepped up and we would teach typewriting. And then when the digital age came along uh, and you could do uh, publishing and writing on the computer, uh, school stepped up and we started to, uh, to teach um, typing on, on a computer, editing, word processing and so forth. But the three steps that are kind of required in the process is first kind of awareness that 
hey, the word of typewriters is now over. Now let's go ahead and switch into typing on the digital system. So that awareness, of course, grows in the commercial system and it's transferred into educational system. And then we tell the students first, hey, this is where we are and this is why you're going to learn uh, typing on the computer. Then there is the process of us helping students to develop the skills, how to use the technology, such as the digital publishing. And then there's the process where this technology matures and is being utilized in the, uh, in, in the community. It becomes normalized. That's basically what you do. Right now, I would propose that we are at the part where we need to raise awareness about AI literacy among our students. And so this is where I want to share with you a module that you can uh, plug in right into your course. And uh, at this point, it doesn't matter what uh, LMS you, you are using. And this course, uh, this module, so whatever course you're teaching, it'll simply attach a module. It's, it's going to talk about uh, what students need to know about AI. So uh, recognizing how pervasive it is around us, uh, how social media um, uh, and, and, and um, everything else is using it. But it talks about uh, four competencies and it breaks it down into awareness, capability, knowledge, and critical thinking. And this particular module really helps students to uh, look more critically at the tools, why they're using them. So if they're going to use ChatGPT at school, is it basically to uh, you know, cheat on this assignment? Or um, am I using that because this actually is going to uh, help me in my job? This actually is the way to, to do these assignments uh, today. And then to critically evaluate the output. One of the principles that uh, AI literacy brings up is that we have to match the use of tools with qualifications of people. So when AI is used by instructors who are subject matter experts, you can validate the output of say generative AI. And so we make this way the use safer, more responsible, this critical evaluation. However, if people who are not qualified to, to um, verify the output, if they're using uh, generative AI, then suddenly you might have a difficulty where they are relying on this output, the output might have hallucinations, it might take them in a completely wrong direction, but they were unable to, to critically uh, evaluate the output. So uh, critical thinking skills, I think will have a huge role moving forward and the first step is to share AI literacy with students. And doing so with students with disabilities, of course, makes, makes a perfect uh, sense here as well. So really, uh, conferences like, uh, like this one helps us to get uh, some ideas, some tools. But at the end of the day, um, AI is going to continue to become more and more ubiquitous in something that we will probably talk less about because it will simply result in individual tools that are working, that are helping us, and we won't have to kind of um, uh, go back and forth like we did with audiobooks, whether they are cheating uh, or not. Well, at this point, uh, I wanted to open up to uh, any questions. Um, uh, feel free to uh, put a question in the, in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, we have uh, just a few minutes uh, to do that. There was a question earlier. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to it. I was talking about the you do it accessibility in Canvas, the accessibility checker. Um, I think it was in relate. It, um, she was asking if what you were talking about was similar to that. Are you familiar with that? Checker? So, so I think it related to uh, the, the, the ally. Product. Ally, yeah. You're right that, um, uh, no, no, I'm not aware of what uh, that particular tool does, but Microsoft Word has a checker. Uh, I think Adobe uh, Writer has a checker as well. So these tools are great when you are, you know, creating the content. Um, but no, I, I'm not uh, aware of the you do it uh, process. But I'm happy to, Julie, if you want to say how it works, uh, feel free to, to tell us. Um. 
Yeah, so can you hear me? Yes. Um, the You Do It Accessibility Checker, and I just looked it up, and I guess it's, um, I put the the link in there. Um, I guess it is the uh, Accessibility Assistant for Canvas, if you go to that link. Um, we use it at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it basically leads you through, if you have a course in Canvas, you can run the you do it accessibility checker and it comes back and tells you how many um, non accessible items it found in your course and you can categorize them by type. Um, and then you can fix them and uh, I don't think it it won't like automatically fix them for you, but it will put it will sort them into um, the easiest to fix you could start with those or every you know, you can go one by one and then you can see like if it's missing alt text, um, you can add that and then go through each thing. So it just reminded me of this when you were showing Ally. Yeah, thank you. And and, and certainly um, uh, accessibility uh, checkup uh, makes makes good sense. Um, I think the awareness, of course, that it produces, right? Just to indicate that, hey, some of your content really needs a second look. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, um, basically AI has been kind of in use for these elements uh, for quite some time. We just never called it that. Um, and and you know what I what I like about Ally is that it can take um, uh, you know larger files and then produce those alternative systems, so or alternative formats. So at this point, it uh, even without the instructor touching the content. You know, it, it it provides for say translation or it provides for the audio recording, but uh, yeah, certainly uh, various LMSs uh, treat accessibility very seriously. Uh, but I I know that LI is uh, definitely available for Canvas as well. Yeah, I think our institution was looking into that as well. Um, another question: uh, Could you provide some resources for doing image description or alt text using AI? Has anyone had? Have, do you have, or has anyone else ha here have experience doing that for online courses? No, right now I I couldn't tell you that there is an embedded tool for that. I think part of the difficulty uh, is same as uh, automated uh, captioning. In other words, uh, the technology does exist. But um, um, the the kind of the levels of efficiency uh, uh, may not be there yet. So uh, there's nothing that uh, we have uh, embedded already uh, in in the LMS. But the technology is is kind of ready to go there. Um, I will say that um, um, I, I I've, actually I think it might have been um, it it might have been in um, uh, LinkedIn where. Uh, it does generate automatically kind of suggestions for 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 uh, description. So it'll say automatically created uh, image description. So at least that Microsoft product, I think, is kind of uh, uh, starting to use it. We have about a minute uh, or two left if there's anyone that has a, a quick conversation or quick question. I think these are just notes um, talking about the the um, what you shared. Um, why don't I go ahead and wrap it up? Um, first of all, I wanted to let you, uh, wanted to thank you, Simon, for your presentation, um, and uh, and thank everybody for attending. I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat um, a link to the the conference evaluation. If you could um, put your evaluation for the session in. Um, and then also I wanted to congratulation, congratulate the session winner, and I apologize if I um, mispronounce your name, Manaka Navarat Navaratna. I'm sorry if I if I mispronounced it. Could if you wouldn't mind, Manaka, if you're still here, um, putting your email address in the chat so I can um, put that down for our folks. Um, and then uh, otherwise, thank you everybody for attending. And I think we have a 15 minute break before the, um, the next session.